My name is Ryan Smith. I'm a graduate student in the Neuroscience Graduate Studies Program here at Ohio State. Um, officially, I'm in the Department of Pharmacology. Um, the title of my talk today is going to be Common Genetic Variants, Modulate Nicotinic Alpha Fiber Receptor, mRNA Expression, and Risk for Nicotine Dependence. So I'll get right into it. <clears throat> Uh, the reason why we're interested in the Alpha-5 subunit in particular is because uh, ever since about 2007, and really um, even continuing today, the region harboring the nicotinic Alpha-5 receptor has been implicated in gen genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. Um, and it's been identified for uh, multiple uh, disease phenotypes, including smoking behavior, <coughs> um, lung cancer, peripheral arterial disease, COPD, um, et cetera. This region, uh, 15Q25, also includes two other nicotinic receptor subunits, the uh, alpha-3 and the beta-4 subunit. So um, perhaps it's not surprising that uh, this region was identified um, through GWAS. Now, uh, the alpha-5 uh, gene is expressed uh, in the mammalian brain pretty much everywhere to a low level or at a low level. Um, however, there are a few different regions where uh, expression is enriched. Um, I'm showing here a sagittal view of a mouse brain taken from the Allen Mouse Brain Atlas that where in C2 hybridization was done against alpha-5 mRNA. And you can see in that blown up section there, that's a ventral tegmental area. You can see a little bit more punctate staining um, and a little bit darker, uh, indicating enrichment in the VTA. Um, Anybody uh, familiar with addiction research will recognize uh, the VTA and, and the venula as being relevant to addiction in general. So in the, uh, in the mammalian brain, uh, nicotinic receptors can be homomeric or heteromeric in nature, and they come together um, as five sub five sub five subunits will come together, typically um, alpha and beta subunits, to form a functional channel that um, is gated by uh, acetylcholine binding. Um, in, the, uh, in the mammalian cortex, the most abundant uh, nicotinic alpha acetylcholine receptor is the alpha-4 beta-2 containing receptors. And that's what I'm showing on the left here is uh, alpha-4 with three subunits, beta-2, two, two subunits, all coming together to form this functional channel. Um, acetylcholine binds at these alpha-4, beta-2 interfaces. I'm showing that in purple there. Now, what was surprising about the alpha-5 subunit is that it comes in and it replaces um, uh, whichever subunit has the, it is uh, in the three stoichiometry, I guess. So. In this case, because there are three alpha-4s, it replaces uh, one of the alpha-4s. Um, but it does not disrupt the acetylcholine binding. Um, so it was thought to be a structural subunit. Um, however, it does change the, um, it does change the signaling of the receptor to uh, a lot greater calcium permeability. Now in the, um, in, I've, this has been estimated in rats anyhow, um, it's estimated that approximately 20 to 30 percent of the alpha-4 beta-2 containing um, receptors also have the alpha-5 incorporated. Now the gene itself, um, we already know through the genome-wide association studies that there are polymorphisms in it in there that um, confer susceptibility to these genetic diseases. The, the first one and the most, the one most commonly linked to alpha-5 is the protein coding variant, RS1696996A. Uh, like I said, this is a non-synonymous variant. It changes uh, the maximal response to epibatidine, um, but I don't think that it's been characterized uh, in the context of nicotine or acetylcholine. Um, more relevant maybe to the research that we're doing um, is a promoter variant that was uh, correlated with increased expression. Now this promoter variant is a deletion of uh, about 22 nucleotides, um, just proximal to the transcription start site. And not only that, but, but in, a, in a clinical association study, it was also um, associated with risk 
for nicotine dependence and I believe also alcohol dependence. <laughs> now the strategy used to uncover this um, expression variant uh, was linear regression against overall alpha-5 mRNA expression. <clears throat> and this methodology um, is what's used to find expression quantitative trait loci, loci or EQTLs. Um, for uh, alpha-5, however, um, we have a, a bit of a problem with using this approach. Um, and it's mostly the uh, high linkage disequilibrium observed within this region. So in the middle of the screen here, I have the alpha-5 gene highlighted in yellow. Next to it are alpha-3 and then beta-4 to the right. And then to the left, you have a few other proteins. Uh, what is represented here um, is a linkage disequilibrium plot where the red represents um, areas of high linkage disequilibrium. So what does so what that means really is that if you're to take that promoter variant that um, I had just discussed and you're to take the genotype of that and correlate it with genotypes all along this this triangle of red here, um, the genotypes will correlate um, to a high degree to that uh, promoter variant. And now what that also means is because that promoter variant is correlated with expression, all the other variants correlated to that, that promoter variant will also be correlated with expression. And so the question is, how do you really find um, the SNPs that are driving um, the expression in this locus? And second, um, why does it matter if you have one variant that is uh, already correlated with expression, why is it necessary to find the, um, the right variant instead of the one that just correlates the best? And I think anybody familiar with um, clinical association studies can tell you that if you have the incorrect variant or the non-functional variant and you're using a surrogate marker, um, the associations with a phenotype can break down very quickly when you get outside of, uh, of the population, or if you start testing the SNPs in different populations, say Caucasians versus African Americans versus um, individuals of Asian descent. And so the question is, how do we um, go about finding the functional SNPs in this region that are driving expression? And we do this um, by measuring allelic expression imbalance. Now I'm going to take you through this um, in probably excruciating detail, um, but it's really important to understand to understand why um, we came to the conclusions that we came to. And so um, every individual uh, inherits two copies of each autosomal gene, one from their mother, one from their father. And each of these genes are going to be expressing their own mature mRNA products. Now, if there's a SNP, in the mRNA and it's heterozygous at that SNP location, we're able to exploit that region to determine the amount of expression being from each allele. And so really what that looks like to us is that, okay, if you take DNA, like I said, it's one to one. Each cell should have one copy of each, um, of each allele. However, in the mRNA, you can see here, uh, the expression is much greater for one allele versus the other. And that's that's really what we term our allelic expression imbalance. And so this sample is heterozygous at this SNP position, and each of these peaks uh, represents an allele. Now what this allows us to do is it allows us to eliminate transacting factors that creep up in EQTL analyses um, because we're measuring the same expression in the same individual, uh, really in the same population of cells. <coughs> and we're just comparing the relative expression of each allele. And now um, what that also allows us to do is it allows us to say that from one allele, we know when we see allelic expression imbalance, we know that there has to be something linked to that allele, but not this allele, um, not, not to the opposite allele um, that's driving the differential expression. And so um, that will become clear why that's important a little bit later. Um, but it, it's a very important point that we're able to distinguish um, the difference in alleles within the same individual. 
And so, like I said, we need we need SNPs within the mature mRNA in order to measure allelic expression imbalance. And for alpha-5, there are two excellent marker SNPs. Um, the first is the non-synonymous variant that's um, of very high frequency in Caucasian Americans. And then there's a second uh, variant that's down in the 3' prime UTR of the gene, um, RS615470. <laughs> Now, because the untranslated region is expressed in the mature mRNA, we can use um, we can use this variant that's all the way down in the three prime UTR. <laughs> now, what we were able to do then um, was measure using these two marker SNPs allelic expression imbalance in our cohort of 92 post postmortem prefrontal cortex samples, and that's another important point to make too, is that in order to measure mRNA, you need the target tissue. Um, where the mRNA is expressed. Um, ideally, um, we would probably want ventrotegmental area, but the prefrontal cortex is also linked to addiction. Um, and alpha-5 is expressed to a high enough degree um, that we're able to use the PFC samples in order to measure AEI. And so uh, what we did then was measure allelic expression in our 92 samples. But we're only able to measure, like I said before, in samples that are heterozygous for one or both of those marker SNPs, and that's what's plotted um, on the graph below. Uh, these are all individual samples that are heterozygous for at least one marker SNP. And now from the allelic expression imbalance, we're able to determine um, the amount of expression from one allele versus the other. So each of these bars represents an individual sample, and the height of the bar represents the difference in allelic expression. So the dotted lines that are going across the screen there, they represent a two and a half fold difference in allelic expression, so that one sample is expressing uh, two and a half fold more mRNA than the other allele. Um, what this plot also tells us, because we've um, because we've plotted it uh, major versus minor allele, is that uh, the variant driving expression is always driving ex greater expression of the major allele um, in terms of our marker SNPs. And not only that, but because all of our samples um, are showing allelic expression in a single, um, uh, in the same way, they are probably, um, the marker SNPs are probably in high linkage disequilibrium with uh, the functional variant. And now the question quickly becomes, how do we go about finding um, the actual functional variants. First of all, we can already rule out the marker SNPs because, like I said before, if the marker SNPs were responsible for driving the allelic difference, every single sample heterozygous at the marker SNP should show an allelic expression imbalance. Um, and that's not the case here. You can see there's a handful of samples towards the left of that graph that do not show an allelic expression imbalance. <clears throat> 